the restrictions were so intense that just the idea of going down those steps to the metro was like, wow, what a day. My passport was withheld for, for the whole trip, so I never knew when I was going back. I didn't have a ticket. I had a rough idea of the plane time, but never knew when the ticket was for. I came to leave North Korea, and I had really strange, bizarre emotions of leaving. I couldn't wait to get out. That's a given. I couldn't wait to leave. But also, these two people that I've been with every day have been with me, you know, the whole time, and I'd never seen them again. It was like, very rarely in this world do we have that time where we say goodbye to someone, and we have an impossibility of contact. It just doesn't happen. So that was bizarre. I had had an amazing time. Um, I'd done five concerts for 3,000 people per night. They'd given me an award, a certificate, an honorary diploma from Pyongyang University for my bridge building uh, efforts. And I was leaving with a bunch of stories and experiences, but I could not wait to leave. It was kind of becoming quite restrictive. So, but I still didn't have my passport. And so the car came to the hotel, I checked out, got in the car, got to the airport, and they have a very bizarre duty-free shop at the airport, which of course is only open twice a week because flights only come twice a week. And f foreigners only come every few months, I imagine. So they turn the lights on and they, and make, they make it look like it's like really busy every day, but actually it's kind of a, you can buy snake wine, the stuff with snake in the bottle, and you can buy some, some um, paintings and things like that. We were standing in the duty-free shop. They gave me my passport and my boarding card and I hugged my two companions. Um, she was quite emotional and it was really hard to leave them behind. It was very, very difficult. So I got my phones back and uh, I got on the bus to the plane, got on the plane and um, the plane was full of interesting people again. My Mongolian um, military orchestra, and, which I'd never seen since actually. I, they were performing it in another place. And I sat on the plane thinking, wow, what a trip, you know. And the plane took off and no incidents and, and I've, I've had to sleep. Landed in Beijing. Now, culture shock is a very strange thing. Going into North Korea, I was ready for it. I, I, I was so prepared and meant psychologically speaking and ready for, for the changes. And, and I, I, of course I did feel culture shock, but it wasn't a big thing. I didn't feel like, oh my gosh, what is this place? But leaving North Korea, I'd spent 10 days without phone, without internet, writing a diary every night, reading books, talking to North Koreans. I was, I'd been in another world and I was not aware of the impact that world had had on me until I left it. I landed in Beijing for a connecting flight to Singapore and I had a few hours. I couldn't believe how much food there was to eat. I couldn't believe the advertising and, and so many, I was bombarded with stuff that I hadn't seen for 10 days. Now that doesn't sound like a big deal. But as a Westerner who is used to that, we experience these things all the time, advertising, food, we, you know, we eat generally what we want when we want. And in North Korea, food was limited. I became quite hungry, in fact. So the, the culture shock was coming out, the adjustment of leaving that place. And it took me a while to, to realize what I'd just been through. It was very strange. And arriving in Singapore, again, very Western society, if you like, a lot of, you know, it's, people have money and there's restaurants and you know music and you're free uh, but North Korea planted something in my in my mind that never left me the control of people in North Korea is extreme and and this, this should not happen to people but then again there are subtle elements of control that we experience in a Western society every day as a musician I if you turn on Radio 1 in the UK you are listening to music that's been paid to play. So record labels are paying stations to play the latest songs and those songs go around your mind and finally, if it's a good song, it will sink into your psyche and you might buy it. In North Korea, they pump out military music on the streets every day, day and night. And I mean, honestly, after two days, I became so sick of it. I, I couldn't hear these songs anymore. After the third day, I didn't notice it. After the fourth day, I was singing along. I was singing along these military songs praising Kim Jong-il because it became so familiar and it was like brainwashing. 
So I think North Korea, it, it, it affected me in a way. And I would go back. I think I would go back in a team, not alone. That was challenging. Um, I, I still believe and I stand by the reasons for going. If nobody goes to North Korea, then what difference can be made? And as a musician, I I'm clearly understand that in moments of creativity, in moments of music, people's imaginations can be challenged, can be inspired, and we have no idea what can be planted in people's minds and hearts, if you like, when you play a concert in a place like that. And there may be one kid, if one kid out of those 15,000 people that I played for started to think in a different way, and that could become a future leader, then my job is done. And I think there's no way to gauge what impact you have because you're not allowed to have contact with people in North Korea. But I trust that the fact that something does happen and people are affected and I will stand by that saying that I would go back, go back and do it again.